Hello, it's Scott Manley here. It's 8th February 2024. It's time for another batch of Deep Space updates. And I'm going to try and keep this weekly thing up for as long as I can. Uh, and that means that we don't have very many launches in the last seven days. But let's rewind uh, back to the 2nd of February. In China, we had a Long March 2C. And it launched 11 GSAT-2s. So these are satellites, part of a constellation for Geely Technology Group. And Geely uh, is a car manufacturer in China, but they're also building out a constellation of satellites. They launched nine of these last year, and they launched 11 of them this time. And these are supposed to be a constellation that provides navigation, they will provide communications, and ultimately, I guess, the idea is this will support the self-driving capabilities of their future cars. Uh, so these satellites, they're about 130 kilograms each, They've been launched into 500 kilometer, sorry, 600 kilometer orbits, 50 degree inclination. The day later, uh, on the 3rd of February, there was another Chinese launch, Jilong 3, also known as Smart Dragon 3. This is an all solid launch vehicle, and the last time they did it was a couple of months ago. So this rocket launched from a mobile sea platform in the China Sea. And uh, this was a rideshare uh, arrangement. There was nine different satellites on board, many different uh, types. There was a SmartSat X1, synthetic aperture radar. Uh, NextSat 1, which is an Egyptian satellite. There was um, Xing Shidai uh, 1819 and 20. These are imaging satellites, apparently with AI capabilities, and a few others. Finally, literally as I'm recording this, 8th of February, we had uh, SpaceX launching NASA's PACE satellite. So that's Plankton's Aerosol Cloud and Ocean Ecosystem Satellite. This is a polar launch. Uh, and of course, this meant that it had to go out beyond the coast. Once the booster was ditched, it flew back and performed a return to launch site. When, whereas the second stage performed a dogleg to bring the satellite around onto a sun-synchronous orbit. So the target orbit is 676 kilometer, you know, 98 degrees. It'll be crossing the equator at one o'clock local time every day. This satellite, frankly, I'm surprised that it got this far because this one, for four years in a row, White House budgets tried to cancel the satellite and Congress kept putting it back in. So yeah, it has already overcome some quite major block, you know, roadblocks to get here. Uh, its main mission is to look at ocean color. And you might think, well, the oceans are blue, but no, you know, ocean color, it's driven by the plankton. It is driven by the algae and all these other things inside it. So there's an instrument called the ocean color instrument. It's a spectrometer that can uh, measure the intensity of light, you know, in great detail. It is about 20 times better than the VERS instrument on board Suomi. There's also a polarimeter that are basically going to measure, like, um, how the geometry of the ocean changes the surface. And uh, this will show whether the light is being reflected or affected by aerosols or clouds or other things. So this is a very important environmental satellite. It's the kind of thing that's going to be incredibly useful for detecting things like massive, hot, toxic ocean algae blooms. So that's launches onto the rest of the news. First of all, Ingenuity, we've got photographs of it from the Perseverance rover using the mast cam, and we can see the helicopter all pretty close to the top of the one of the dunes. Uh, it looks, if you look carefully, you can see that it has dragged down laterally across the dune. You can see the marks made by the legs. And if you look very carefully, about uh, 15 meters away, we estimate, there is a black dot and some clear disturbance on another dune. This is probably a fragment of a rotor which impacted over there. Now, what we've seen doesn't really give us huge clues as to how the rotors got damaged because you don't, we can't really see any like witness marks or whatever where the rotors might have interacted or intersected with the surface. So there's still something to be learned as we get closer to it, and I hope that we do actually learn more. On the International Space Station, uh, cosmonaut Oleg Kononenko has now set a new record for the total time spent in space. He has exceeded Gennady Padalka's record of 878 days. And uh, by the end of this mission, you know, late September when he's supposed to return, it'll be over 1,100 days in space. That's three years. And of course, 
you know, Gennad, like Oleg, he's just like, ah, oh, you know, I travel into space to do science and do research. It's my favorite thing. I'm not doing it to set records. Well, great. Good for you. Congratulations. Um, and so, yeah, we'll see. He'll, he'll come back. We'll see what the actual record is. But that is a fairly large lead over any U.S. citizen. Let's be clear. The James Webb Space Telescope has managed to get direct images of a pair of planet candidates around two different metal-polluted white dwarf stars. So let's, let's just set the scene. If you look at our solar system, the sun is about halfway through the main sequence. Once it gets through this hydrogen burning phase, it will blow up into a red giant and you, you know, through these pulsations, it will probably consume Mercury, Venus, Earth, maybe even Mars. And uh, what we'll be left with is like Jupiter and Saturn and whatnot. And eventually, the star, after going through this red giant phase, it'll collapse down into just, it'll blow off the outer surface and be left with like a degenerate core of white dwarf star in the middle. And since this is a core of a star, there's a, you know, there's these things called metal polluted white dwarfs where we see other materials in them that shouldn't have come from the core of the star. So the theory is that there must be planets around these things and they're still gravitationally active and they're occasionally diverting comets and other rocky material into the star, enriching the metallicity of these things. So with the JWST, they went looking at various candidate objects and they found what look like uh, potentially planets around these. Now, these are not guaranteed to be planets, but based upon the colors, the spectroscopy, these can't be distant stars. It could potentially be a distant galaxy, but they just need to wait long enough to see it move around the star so that they can confirm this. So this is pretty cool being able to directly image planets around white dwarfs. It's been a few years since the, the Air Force and the Department of Defense said that they were investigating point-to-point -point rocket cargo capabilities using Starship. And we just had a, an interesting little panel at a conference where uh, Gregory Spaniers, the, the chief scientist overseeing this program, basically you know, held forth about his opinion, saying that, you know, the last 10 years or so, point-to-point -point rocket cargo always seemed ridiculous. And the last couple of years, it suddenly seemed a whole lot less ridiculous. And while they're not, what they're definitely looking at what would need to be done to make this a possibility. And what they are focusing on is containerizing cargo in such a way that it could survive a point to point rocket trip. Now, they're not talking about dropping Starship directly onto a battlefield, an unimproved area, and then offloading it. They're talking literally traveling stuff across the world from one point to another very quickly. They have certainly looked at the possibility of deploying, say, um, re-entry vehicles from Starship, which could then land in unimproved regions with materials. Uh, that's another technology that could potentially be covered by this. So, yes, U.S. Department of Defense is still very much looking at rocket cargo point to point as a legitimate thing. It's not ruled it out, but it's not throwing a ton of money at it just yet. They're just hoping that this might work. Uh, the Juno spacecraft it is orbiting Jupiter and it just made the closest approach to Io in its, well, it's in this flight, but it also means that it has had some of the best images of Io in decades. In fact, this is the first image of the sub-Jovian point, that is the point closest to Jupiter, since the Voyager spacecraft flew by. If you remember, Galileo was flying around Jupiter for a long time, but it was hamstrung because its connectivity back, its ability to download data was severely restricted. And so it could only send back a very small amount of uh, stuff. Now, on the other hand, Juno, its main limitation is that the camera, Juno Cam, first of all, that's not the primary instrument. Uh, it has a relatively wide field of view. It doesn't zoom in nearly enough to do the sort of level of detailed surface analysis that we would see with you know, Galileo's instrument. But by flying within like 900 kilometers of the moon, we have seen some amazing imagery. We have got images showing like uh, volcanoes, actually active volcanoes along the edge of the planet. And if you look along the edge of Io in some of these images, you can actually see the terrain 
rising and falling along the limb, getting an idea of how big these mountains are. Also, on the dark side, we can actually see detail because it is illuminated by reflected light from Jupiter, right? Io illuminated by Jupiter's shine. And of course, i got to stress, Juno Cam is not an instrument which is being operated on by the scientists running Juno. This is a community thing. The data goes out, it's posted on the web, and people in the community are doing this processing and analysis to bring us these amazing images. Uh, Virgin Galactic, after their recent flight, they had to announce that they are investigating a minor problem where a, an alignment pin in the like mating mechanism apparently fell off sometime after the spacecraft launched and headed off to, into space. So presumably what this means is it came back and they were like, there's supposed to be a pin there, but it's not. I don't know if they saw this falling off. They might have cameras. The, um, but this is a pin. It doesn't support the load like vertically. It's used to align the uh, spaceship too for them to like you know, get it onto the cradle correctly and I guess because it sticks down it also supports some sort of like lateral you know drag loads on it and it fell off. Now apparently this uh, you know FAA is going to be interested because if you've got dropping bits off a plane that are made of metal you want to make sure that it's not you know something that could potentially be part of a larger and bigger you know more dangerous problem. On Twitter today, I saw a cool thing from Rocket Lab. On their recent flight, four of a kind, they mounted a, a piece of the thermal protection system from their neutron rocket, and they showed us how well it had performed. Now, the material around it, obviously, uh, isn't the TPS. It's the black area in the middle. And I think the material around it was subject to higher heat loads because anything that sticks out right, you're changing the airflow around it and you're going to get much more, um, much harder thermal environments from that. So yeah, I guess they test that stuff in flight. It'd be nice to actually see them testing a whole neutron rocket sometime. Uh, JPL have announced that they have to shed 8% of their staff. They're laying off 8% of their staff, like that's 530 employees, 40 contractors, because they basically, uh, they've, they've gone through cost reductions. They don't have the budget because NASA has had to cut back on the Mars sample return budget because they don't know how much money they're actually going to get from the budget. So Mars sample return is the thing with the longest window right now. So they're cutting that down. And of course, this is part of the bigger problem in the US. That we still don't have a budget at this point. It's all continuing resolutions. NASA doesn't know exactly how much money it's going to get for the various programs. And so, yeah, JPL is uh, having to cut back, having to lay off scientists and engineers who cannot work on this project right now. As we speak, the Axiom Crew-3, they are in a Dragon spacecraft free from the International Space Station. They got to stay a few extra days. I think they were supposed to come back on Monday. But uh, yeah, as of right now, it looks like they're landing Friday. So they got a few extra days in space. But I think at some point, the ISS, they kicked them out the door and said, get out of here. We need you guys to go home, right? What is it? What is it? It's time. You don't have to go home, but you can't stay here, right? <laughs> well, anyway, I, I wish them the best. They'll be coming back soon. And yeah, that'll be great. So yeah, that's one thing to look forward to in the next couple of days. The other big one, I think, is Intuitive Machines. Their lunar lander, Odysseus, uh, it has been mated, encapsulated, prepped for flight, tested. They've announced that it's going to launch on February 14th and head to the moon. And it is going to be carrying like six payloads from the Commercial Lunar Payload Services uh, program from NASA. But I find it more interesting the fact that it has a cryogenically fueled engine. And this is, I think, is going to be the first time that any nation has tried to land a spacecraft on the moon using a cryogenic propulsion system. So in the multiple days that it's going to take to get there, maneuver and land, they have to maintain this stuff in a zero or minimal boil off state to make sure they have enough propellant to land on the moon. So that's going to go on February 14th. Hope that it's successful. I'll be looking forward to it and I hope that I have good news to report on this next week. Until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.